Hey, what's up guys? I want to do a video on this vintage K-Bar uh, and, and talk a little bit about the history of K-Bar. I think it's extremely fascinating. I did a, a video once before talking about um, where K-Bar got its name. And long story short, if you didn't see that video, there was a letter by a, a trapper um, who sent it to the, uh, the company at the time and said that they used their knife. And the letter was very um, unlegible. And the only thing they could really make out was k dash a dash bar b a r and what they later figured out to be was a portion or a partial note of him trying to say kill a bear like i use your knife to kill a bear basically he was a hunter trapper and there was a big old uh, you know bear that he was going to shoot and his uh his rifle jammed or you know it didn't spark i, I forget what you know the exact details are in the story but now the bear was rushing him and he pulled out his knife at the time um, and he had killed the bear with it. And they thought that was a fantastic idea to use that name. And some of the original models were named like Baby Grizzly and, you know, Black Bear, stuff like that. So that's where the name came from. It, you know, Kill a Bear. It's from that letter. It's actually a pretty interesting story. Uh, you can find out more specific details and the exact details <laughs> online if you, if you wish to. But that's the gist of it. Uh, old time trapper. Gun didn't work at the time. Would have died. Saved his life with his knife. And that's when the company created this K-Bar line. So pretty, pretty fascinating within itself. Um, this specific knife was a gift for someone. It is one of my favorite knives in my collection. I have probably a dozen knives that just have sentimental meaning to me. Uh, this came from another YouTuber. It was one of the first gifts I ever got on YouTube. And um, it was just a basically a response for, for me doing something nice. The, the YouTuber's Crazy Cole Rogers. Uh, I haven't seen any videos from lately. I'm not sure if he created a new channel or not. But yeah, Crazy Cole Rogers, he used to post um, a lot of videos on uh, a lot of martial arts type stuff. Um, very uh, into um, swords at the time too. I believe he was probably 15 or 16 years old and he had a uh, just a tremendous um, knowledge of uh, Japanese arts and you know, particularly martial arts of all different kinds, but he did a lot of videos on uh, you know, slashing uh, the rice mats and just uh, he had a group of friends that were really into that kind of stuff. And around the same time period where I started enjoying his channel and watching his videos, um, CRKT uh, sent me a uh, Hisho for review, and which was basically a very large fixed blade, very Japanese uh, um, styled fixed blade. And I used it for a couple of videos and slashing and piercing for reviews. And um, when I was all done with the review, th again, this is one of the first uh, knives that were sent to me by a company to review and that I didn't have to you know, go out and buy or, or trade for. So it was an amazing thing within itself and it was, it was a pretty cool thing. And um, at the time, I didn't know what I was gonna do. I was gonna uh, trade it for more knives to do reviews on it or sell it and take the money and buy more stuff to review. But um, I saw the passion in, uh, in Cole's eyes when he was making these videos and he was just into it. And I thought it'd be really cool just to surprise him. I mean, it was like a $300 knife. And uh, I just asked for his address and he kind of was like, okay, sure. And there was that internet trust. And there certainly is quite a bit of internet trust here when people share their addresses and information and stuff like that. But um, he sent me his address, he was out in California and I sent out, I, you know, I asked, I said, is it cool if your parents let me send you something? And he's like, oh yeah, that, that's fine. And talked to his parents uh, on the phone and they're like, well, it's, you know, it's very nice of you and blah, blah, blah. So I sent it out to him and he was just like totally blown away by it. And I thought, you know what, this is a person who just as much as I appreciate knives and stuff like that, uh, I'm definitely more of a folding knife guy. And I, I have a more of an appreciation for fixed blades these days and a little bit more of a use for them. But at that specific time, I thought, you know what, this kid is gonna just love this knife and he's gonna use it. And he's gonna use it all the time. And he's gonna sharpen it and he's gonna cut stuff and it's gonna be amazing for him. So I just did that as a gift, as an appreciation for, for him making his videos. And um, he was blown away by it, completely blown away. And like out of the blue, about a month later, um, I got this. He must have saved my return address. And uh, he sent this in the mail with a uh, very nice letter. And apparently this was his uh, grandfather's knife. And it was an old K-Bar. And I thought that was really, really cool. Um, just two really complete strangers that connect on the same level just because of a hobby. And it's something that's really nice. And a lot of people experience that on YouTube. Complete strangers of all different ages. You know, sometimes it's, it's women and men. Sometimes it's men and men, women and women, whatever. Um, from all different backgrounds. It's just, it's an amazing connection you have just because of your hobby. 
you know, other than knives, we're, we're just complete strangers, but we connect on that same level. So I thought I was really, really blown away as well and just very appreciative of his, uh, his gift. And I've had it ever since. And this is a knife, uh, a knife. It's a knife that I plan to, um, to eventually fix up and I want to get a new sheath for it because the original sheath is broken. I'll show you that in a minute. Um, and maybe carry it and use it. I think it's fantastic, but it's certainly a part of knife history. Um, this knife is uh, dated anywhere from 1923 to 1951. Uh, K-Bar's uh, stamps and markings and stuff are a little bit fuzzy in the history. It's unlike Case or something where it's real specific. You could figure out exactly when it was made. There's uh, tons and tons of research that has to go into uh, knowing exactly like what year. But that's the range. 1923 is when K-Bar first appeared as a tank stamp. Okay, K-A-B-A-R. So if you do have that on your knife, then it's at least, or I, shouldn't, I should say, at least from 1923 or to present, you know? It's not gonna be before that time. But um, the other thing that gives me the 1951 date is underneath on the reverse, it says Union Cutlery Co. and Olean, New York. O-L-E-A-N, New York. Now, that combination of tank stamps was used up until 1951. So that, that's what gives me that range of dates. Really interesting old uh, uh, hunting knife. Really beautiful blade design here. You got the rounded spine. This is way before <laughs> the Bradley Mayhems and the you know, Sabenzas and I always see stuff like this. It's like, oh wow, that's, that's so cool. Why didn't they think of doing that? You know, just rounding the spine for comfort. Yeah, there, there's nothing really new in knives. Occasionally you'll get something that's out there design wise, like the Kershaw ET. Obviously something like that's never been done before. But a lot of the little subtle things in knives we see today and we're like, oh my God, why didn't they think of that? They thought of it. It's been done. I mean, you're talking hundreds of years. Well, at least a hundred years of, uh, of working on different types of uh, uh, knives. So just a beautiful knife within itself. It's got the stacked leather handle. Um, it's in a very good shape considering its age. It's definitely older than I am. Um, again, I can't pinpoint exactly how old, uh, but it's no younger than uh, 1951. So just to give you an idea, it has a very real patina. Sometimes we like to force patinas and get that look, but this is really, when you break out, you know, your grandparents and great grandparents knives, that's the kind of condition you see. Scratches everywhere, a nice patina on it. But this has character, this has use, this has history. Knives weren't babied back in the day, you know, in the forties, people didn't really have collector's knives, I'm sure. In some cases there were, but most people who are spending money on a knife is because they needed it and they used it and they weren't afraid to use it. And luckily this one was not sharpened to nothing. A lot of these old knives, um, you'll find that they end up looking like uh, fillet knives because people sharpen them so aggressively that it literally took off like half the blade. You'll see old hunting knives like this and the blade will be like, you know, a half an inch thick. It'll just be like the spine because, you know, woodsmen's and, and hunters, they would just sharpen them. But it was so crude that they literally took off tons of metal. And they didn't, you didn't throw out knives, you didn't lose knives. They were very important to you back in the day, so you kept using the same one. If it wasn't broken, you didn't fix it. It's got a nice little brass uh, guard here. Just gives you a little bit of something so you don't ride up. Obviously not a huge guard. It's not gonna protect you that much for a thrust. But uh, on the reverse here, or on the pommel, you can see the construction here basically, it might be a little bit hard to see, but this, the tang goes into a uh, kind of a rod and works away, its way all the way through the knife, and that's where you have the stacked pieces of leather, which was later formed into your handle. Um, but it looks like there's a piece missing. Perhaps the pommel itself was kind of a rounded nut that went on that screw. I'm sure I can find something that would fit that, which eventually I might do. I'm not sure if I should keep this, ex I might keep it exactly how it is and just find something like that to tighten it up, because there's just a tiny bit of play in that pommel in the last spacer. So I might just do that. Originally I thought, no, I'll just use the blade and I'll have someone make a handle for me or something like that, but I like to keep it original like this. It's pretty neat. Um, just feels great, believe it or not, it's nice and sharp. It's one of those knives that was just used and used and used, but taken care of and, uh, you know, it's still sharp. It's great. Um, the sheath here, you can see that there's, uh, this is the original sheath, there is stitching missing. All right, most likely from the sharp tip and the knife was put in cockeyed or something, it most likely cut that. Um, and then of course, the uh, button snap here. The one side has worn so much from use that it literally, the leather just ripped so you don't have the other end of the snap that would snap on. But overall, still very decent condition considering its age. 
But uh, you know, K-Bar's history is very fascinating. And I wanted to read some stuff from their website. Now I'm gonna put a link in the description box to two things. The first thing is a link directly to um, K-Bar's history page so you can see exactly what I'm reading. If you wanna read again or you don't, you know, you can't follow along with what I'm saying because I'm reading too fast or whatever the case may be. If you wanna look at it later, uh, you know, later time, that link will be there for you. As well as another link um, to a, a book. I believe it's on knifeworld.com. Uh, it's a book that I read years ago. And at the time, I didn't really know the connection that much until obviously I read the book. But I got it in a trade with a bunch of movies, VHS tapes on knife fighting and stuff like that. Um, but it's about the town of uh, Tidouet. And that's the only way I, I know to pronounce it. It may not be that. It's T I D I O U T E. It's in Western Pennsylvania. And the book uh, title is A Town with an Edge. And it's, it's all about how what is now K Bar started this little town and. and you know, started the knife industry and stuff like that. And I'm going to read about the town in the history here in a second. But um, I just thought it'd be fun to, to show you this knife, tell the story, and read some of this history because it's really fascinating. So uh, it starts here on their, um, their page from 1800 to 1899. So in 1800, the U.S. cutlery industry begins in uh, New England uh, with a group of cutlers from England Sheffield Cutlery Industry, and they all band together. April 29th, 1897. In the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, a group of 38 men formed a limited partnership uh, known as the Tito Wet Cutlery Company to manufacture, and, to manufacture and sell cutlery. The formation is now widely considered to be the beginnings of K-Bar Knives, Inc. 1898. First sales of cutlery marks the beginning of K-Bar as it is today. In uh, 1902, Mr. Wallace R. Brown, or excuse me, Brown, uh, purchases the assets of the Tito Wet Cut uh, Cutlery Company and applies to the governor of Pennsylvania to form a corporation, uh, the Union Razor Company, later changed to Union Cutlery Company in 1909. And that's what the markings are on here. They show before the Union Cutlery Company. Should be on the back there, right on top. So that uh, company was created in 1909. Uh, for the purpose of manufacturing and selling cutlery. December 1911, a new Union Cutlery Company is registered in Olean, New York, creating two Union Cutlery Company incorporations, the original in Titoet, Pennsylvania, and the new one in Olean, New York. Once the, the Olean facility is operating successfully, the Titoet, Pennsylvania plant is closed down. So the original plant, the companies that started these knives, uh, was closed down in Pennsylvania, and the new one in only New York was basically started. And that was ironically in 1911. So K-Bar's history kind of started in 1911. And obviously all you gun guys are going, oh yeah, 1911, like the gun. Yes. <laughs> so it's kind of interesting how all these different, different uh, hobbies and stuff kind of mesh together. So 19, uh, 1911, of course, the gun design is established, you know, and later these knives are going to go to our soldiers as well as the guns. Just a fascinating bit of information. So, uh, and by the way, it's still in Olean, which I'll read later. But yeah, December 1911. All right, let's see. In uh, 1920s, during the period, uh, trademarks like Old Cut, Keenwell, and K-Bar are adopted and established on the knives. Okay, so there was a variety of these because they were still subdivisions of the main, uh, excuse me, main company. So there are some, like if you go on eBay, you'll see some old, uh, old cut, it's O-L-C-U-T. And uh, Keenwell is a little bit more rare. I don't see those as often, but of course, all the old K-bars, like this one right here. Uh, circa 1942, soon after the start of World War II, the Union Cutlery Company submits a K-bar branded knife to the U.S. Marine Corps for issue for fighting personnel. In 1942, the Marine Corps accepted a reworked design of the submitted knife and begins using it as their standard issue fighting utility knife. So World War II, now our soldiers have K-bars, okay, what's now known as the USMC knife, um, also using their 1911 pistols in some cases. So, I don't know, just, I, I find that connection fascinating. It's not really a connection, but obviously liking guns and knowing somewhat about guns, it's it's fascinating to think about two different things happening at the same time period. You know, like uh, some things, um, I'll talk about this more in Zippo videos, but 1932, when George G. Blaisdell, you know, kind of invented the Zippo lighter, 
there was a lot of other things going on in the world. A pretty active time for history. But anyway, uh, 1952, due to the role of the K-Bar branded USMC knife in the war, the directors of the company decided to change the corporate name officially to K-Bar Cutlery Inc. Because uh, now they're an established knife company and the, the K-Bar name is pretty well known at the time. 1960s, K-Bar is sold to the Brown family and subsequently goes through a series of ownership changes, ultimately being sold in 1966 to Cole National Corporation in Cleveland, Ohio. And then uh, May 1996, the K-Bar product line and assets are sold to Alcus Corporation of Olean, New York. Late 1997, K-Bar Knives Inc. dramatically enhances its national product distribution with the addition of five manufacturing representative firms with hose territory spans the entire United States. In 1998, K-Bar celebrates its 100th year in knife making business. And 2003 till present, K-Bar moves to its current location, which is 200 Homer Street in Olean, New York, which they reside today. So I thought this would be just really fascinating to talk about this kind of stuff. I mean, I, I literally printed this information and read off the paper to you. Um, and, and like I said, the link, the first link will bring you right to this if you want to reread it or look at it later. It's one of K-Bar's uh, website pages. Um, as well as the other link that goes right to the book if you want to learn more about uh, Tito Wet, Pennsylvania and uh, its histories in, you know, basically in the knife industry. And a lot of roots came from that town. Just really fascinating stuff. I mean, I like looking at old knives. Of course, I, I love the new tactical stuff that comes out. But sometimes learning where knives kind of came from and, and where it all began is very fascinating. That's when I was talking about that uh, Bernard Levine book and looking back and seeing all the old knife companies and things kind of click. When you start reading about knife history, you'll, you'll see a, a knife company name and you're like, oh yeah, I've heard of that name or I've seen those knives before. And it all kind of melts together. It all starts at one place and spiders out. But it's, it's just fascinating to me. And like I said, I just want to show off this knife because uh, it does mean a lot to me. And uh, if you happen to know, if you used to subscribe to Crazy Cole Rogers and he has a new page, please let me know what his new uh, channel name is. And, uh, and everyone else, put it in the comments so people can check him out because I miss his videos. But anyway, that's all. Thanks for watching, guys. Appreciate your time as always. And uh, if you have any uh, K Bar related videos, please make a video response. That's how you know, a lot of people get exposed to, to other people's channels by their, their video responses. Just kind of there. <laughs> you see a little thumbnail and you go, hey, what's this about? And you click on it. So please feel free to do that with pretty much any of the videos, as long as the video is somewhat related. <laughs> to the original video. I, I've always welcomed video responses. We're a video community. That's what we do and I love uh, sharing stuff and that's how I'm exposed to new stuff too. And you get thousands of messages and sometimes it's hard to filter through them and people send me videos and sometimes I miss them. But if you post a video response, more and more than likely I'll say it. So anyway, thanks for your time and I uh, hope you guys enjoy the rest of your day. Take care.